So we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is going to be by uh, UNHCR and UN Habitats on uh, settlement profiling uh, and the settlement profiling tool um, by Jonathan Weaver and uh, John Wayne. Uh, Jonathan, are you okay to share your screen for the presentation? Sure, let me just try one second. Another Cox Bazaar favorite coming up. <laughs> yes, hold on. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I think, uh, John, are you online too? I think you are online, <laughs> but I'm not sure if you're... Yeah, can there. you hear me, Jonathan? Perfect, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for, for having us to speak today. Um, what we're gonna talk about a little bit is the sediment profiling tool, which was developed um, last year uh, out of a number of uh, pieces of work uh, together with um, UNHCR. So John, do you want to, do you want to start? Sure, thanks Jonathan. And uh, thanks CCCM colleagues for the opportunity to present this settlement profiling tool. Um, just as a kickoff, um, this is the result of a uh, year-long collaboration between UN Habitat and UNHCR on, on a number of initiatives. Um, what is it? Well, it's a multi-sectoral description and analysis of, uh, in our case, a UNHCR-supported settlement through a spatial lens. Um, what does it do and why do we need it? Um, what we want to do is, is, is look closely at um, our settlements. I mean, according to our matrix, we have about a thousand under four categories, IDP camps, IDP settlements, refugee camps, refugee settlements. What we want to do is closely look um, at those settlements, uh, as I said, through a spatial lens. This is primarily a shelter and settlement initiative and understand what challenges um, exist for, for enhancing the design of that particular settlement. Um, also, what are the advantages of that settlement? I mean, how, how can we improve this settlement to align more with, with our integrated aims? Um, as you may well know, our mantra is settlements as a last resort are certainly camps as a last resort. And what we're looking for is trying to understand how best we can invest in settlements to make them um, have improved opportunities for integration with uh, national frameworks uh, and thus benefit both refugee and host communities. Who are these profiles for? Well, well, they're for the refugee and host communities primarily and have to be done from a bottom-up approach in co close consultation with, with the affected communities. But the idea is to have a um, comprehensive documents that can be used by representatives and others to, to look for funding for infrastructural initiatives. As we well know, when we talk about infrastructure, it's generally high cost initiatives and um, UNHCR can't do it by themselves. So by doing a profile, it will give a set of recommendations that can be brought to World Bank and other donors to, to see how we can um, invest uh, holistically into the upgrade of a particular settlement. Um, Jonathan will go into the details of how we did these settlement profiles in collaboration with UN Habitat, but going forward uh, from a UNHCR perspective, we, we really want to see how we can do these profiles in-house um, with a reasonable time frame and within a reasonable budget. So what we're looking at going forward is developing a lighter version of these profiles and that's work in progress. Um, just to mention that in the profiles, we do strongly uh, link with our master plan approach for settlement planning, which is a, um, a framework that we've developed for the higher level um, conceptual analysis of settlements. Um, so with that as an initial introduction, I'll hand back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, John. Okay, so yeah. Building on that, uh, the collaboration uh, with UNHCR, um, I'm, I'm based within the urban planning, finance and economy section of UN Habitat's headquarters, um, particularly on the humanitarian development and work stream. And our team has become uh, increasingly involved with this work as part of our kind of spatial planning operations, um, particularly with a focus on contexts where a humanitarian development lens is appropriate. So 
uh, UN Habitat's mandate obviously is focusing on uh, the attainment of SDGs, particularly SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Uh, and so obviously working with uh, the communities in, in, in human settlements that are hosting displaced populations, both refugees, IDPs and hosting communities, as well as the local authorities or municipalities that, that, that help support those areas are a logical key stakeholders. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're increasingly involved in this sphere. So our work in general is premised on utilizing planning or urban planning as a vehicle to support better coordinated interventions. Uh, to help with both managing the human settlements that are facing the displacement crises, as well as to work on the developing more sustainable trajectories for the future. Uh, so building again on what John was saying, lots of settlements are looking to, to, to that are protracted and, and what can be done in the long term. So we see our work very much spanning both the CCCM and shelter perspectives and look to engage where possible with both sectors, clusters um, and, and uh, getting inputs from them. Um, and as well, very much linking this to local governments and the municipal authorities as, as they're the ones handling these areas in the long term. So uh, why do we think it's useful? Uh, why carry out settlement profiling? So obviously this is profiling in general is not a new thing, um, but from our side, we see there are two trends which are essentially driving a large part of the rationale behind this. Uh, firstly, uh, increasing number of protracted crises globally. Um, as well as the, and therefore the pressure on humanitarian and development funding to respond to these things. Um, and additionally, obviously, there's the rapid urbanization um, and influxes, particularly to urban contexts in low income countries where local authorities may already be struggling to provide basic services and, and um, infrastructure to their communities and therefore face even larger challenges when dealing with uh, the added uh, challenge of an influx of, of, of displaced populations. So on the screen here, a couple of um, uh, challenges, or a, a, a couple of contexts at opposite ends of the scale, um, where it sort of helps us to sort of well, context where we started to see that coordinated and planned interventions are critical. So on, on, on one side, we have Somalia, where, where land is not so much a challenge, but piecemeal interventions are happening quite regularly from our experience, that, from our, our field teams, and therefore to respond to the challenges going forward, coordinating this from a spatial perspective to support both more effective implementation and management for the humanitarians in the short term and local institutions in the longer term is, is almost essential because delivering services in, in a context like this is, is both costly and, and inefficient. The other end of the scale in, in places like Cox, Danny obviously just giving a, a, some interesting perspectives on that. Um, huge number of actors, extremely limited space and everyone tripping over each other to implement. Uh, so I'm sure everyone is aware of the, the challenges that were being faced there. Um, and this is quite common in a lot of contexts. There's lots of actors, lots of activities going on. D data can be very rich, but sometimes varied quality, particularly when the crisis is protracted. And so it inhibits a clarity of or a common understanding of the longer term issues that, that the settlement is likely to face or is already facing. And therefore, we see this as a starting point to develop a coordinated response in, in or let's say, a coordinated approach in responding to this. So in both cases that you see on screen um, and a myriad in, in the middle, uh, there's a really limited or, or at certain points have been a limited cross-sectoral spatial understanding of the situation, which really limits the ability to implement effectively. And so we feel that the spatial profiling tool and the work that comes out of it uh, can help to plug this gap. So um, additionally, uh, again, referring to Cox as an example, um, we see that, in, but this is again applicable to many contexts which are facing a humanitarian crisis, the de decisions about how to intervene are made within uh, the, the kind of context specifically of the humanitarian site um, and with limited integration to the surrounding context, both in terms of the physical infrastructure or, or ecosystems, but also the policy frameworks and priorities that, that, may, that, that, that are, are really important to the area. So in this case, uh, in, in Cox, we knew that the development banks were coming in to implement lots and lots of infrastructure, but without any clear mapping or, or a solid evidence base to demonstrate what long-term impact this might have. And that presented huge challenges on the ground. So what we think is, is, is really helpful in this kind of context is a common evidence-based consensus of what's there, uh, what needs to happen, and that can help focus and target implementation on the ground much better. Um, and what's really important to, to this is that we very much see this needs to take into account both the sort of 
uh, national or local context, but also the humanitarian activities and the needs that are being reflected from the ground and therefore input from, from, from field uh, colleagues. Um, so that this can be linked also to very much the priorities that are happening outside the site boundary because they often are, are fa fairly similar in some cases. And this can make sure that the interventions that are put into the settlement can also add value in the long term to the wider area and help in building a case with the various authorities who may um, uh, be, you know, uh, who we have to deal with. Ad additionally, um, sorry, I'm facing challenges with my screen here. Sorry. Can you still hear me, by the way? Yeah, we can still hear you. Sorry, I'm not sure what, what happened there. Give me one second. Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, not yet. Let me try again. There? Yes. Okay, apologies. Okay, uh, so um, so obviously, you know, the challenges we face are in, in the field are, are are very complex, and so it's we also want to not criticize it, but say it's a reality that we have to face. And so we also know it's very difficult in an operational setting to have the luxury to step back and look beyond the boundary. Um, but the reality is, is that site plans um, or, or any planned intervention is it's very difficult to make when you're responding to an influx. So we see that, uh, particularly in protracted settings, a cycle of shifting, well-intentioned, but perhaps short-term uh, responses culminate in very costly operations and, and puts pressure on the response, but also limits the ability to provide dignified living conditions and self-reliance in the long term. So settlement profiling aims to, let's say, rapidly build a baseline of the spatial information um, and retroactively initiate planning processes to help more effectively target into, uh, interventions, primarily in, in infrastructure, but also to, to support uh, improvement in the management and service provision, uh, because those two things obviously very much fit together. Um, and then this can also, at the same time, inform a, a bigger planning operation or structural plan formulation together with the stakeholders, both humanitarian or, or, or local government, et cetera. Um, and therefore to us, the shelter and uh, shelter site planners are key, key in that, but obviously the linkages to the settlement or, or camp managers who are delivering those services and know a lot more detail about the physical challenges in that need to be uh, engaged in this uh, and um, uh, in, included in the decision-making process. So, um, it's important then to distinguish this from a plan. The idea is that it's not just to come make a plan, but to build an evidence base to support decision-making that can in inform a plan. Uh, the idea is cheaper, quicker, but ultimately provides the information to make decisions now, um, and as well as those long-term considerations. So the aim is to offer a relatively detailed snapshot of the conditions across a series of scales that impact the development of the areas hosting displaced populations. That again, as John mentioned earlier, can be used by uh, officials, agencies, donors, the communities uh, to inform strategic decisions uh, uh, and uh, camp management strategies. Um, and therefore, and the other thing to mention on this is obviously is, is to provide recommendations and outline scenarios about what the future could hold if different routes are taken that align to policy environment, um, et cetera. So the tool is very much about is uh, aimed to be as simple as possible um, and kind of a process of developing this information or evidence base um, and is focused on supporting field teams to collect and prepare this information in conjunction with all the actors that are on the ground. The idea is to capture change and adaptation over time to understand how a settlement has come to be how it is so that can allow us to kind of make some forecasts how we think it may, may change in the future, but also for monitoring. Um, and what's important is that in order for this to be useful, we also need to be aware of what's good enough rather than trying to find the perfect sets of data. Um, building therefore on uh, existing knowledge, the perspectives of local, local communities, local government, field officers, um, and as well the studies and plans that may have already been carried out uh, in, in the area because we find often there's so much work that is already out there, so much information that's already out there. And so it's a case of consolidation and then spatializing a lot of that information so that we're well informed. 
and that this can be shared with more with, with a broader group of, of, of actors. Uh, and so therefore the critical aspect is that the data can be spatialized and, and visualized to ensure that you know, the effect of what the decisions that are made uh, on the wider area as a whole can be considered. And the scale of that can vary context to context. And so the idea is very much to start from you know, uh, looking wide, the national or district scale, to identify you know, what are the issues or challenges and opportunities that could be latched into, and then zooming in uh, through this process to, con to kind of um, identify concrete re recommendations and interventions that are field oriented and can actually be implemented. Um, and obviously this kind of line of inquiry or investigation throughout is to try and build a narrative or business case around why we should do something. And that can help convince both governments as well as donors. Um, and, and so convincing stakeholders is really important. Um, the tool itself, this is just a snapshot from, from the document. Um, it, so <laughs> it's obviously very small on here, but the idea is the step-by-step um, uh, approach with a framework of questions to try and be as comprehensive as possible whilst also being realistic that not all questions will realistically be able to be answered in all contexts, but the idea is to capture the most important trends. Uh, it also explains how to spatialize this information, how it can capture and, and, and share the messaging most effectively, uh, what tools can be used, what sources can be looked into, and it's important to say that although we we have uh, you know we're uh, a headquarters team, we have developed this with field input, and it was actually developed as you know in in, in developing pro, uh, profiles themselves. So the idea is that this was learned by doing or tested by doing, um, and and again using both existing uh, field data as well as open data, so that we minimize the need to 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 kind of collect. Uh, new data specifically for this exercise and we think that's really important so that it becomes a sort of relatively quick and light activity let's say uh, within within reason obviously um, so a really quick snapshot of the outputs uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples from what we did in, in Uganda in Naki Valley but I also recommend to have a look at the Kebrebea study which we did um, uh, in Ethiopia which is a much smaller settlement and therefore goes in a, into a bit more detail uh, in this case, our analysis at national scale was really helpful to outline the links between the kind of protracted displacement that uh, has been happening in Uganda, but also the urbanization trends, um, which are increasingly exacerbated by climate change. Um, and therefore, within the, the, the settlement and the district we were looking at, the, the, let's say the information we were with the analysis was starting to show that the situation is unlikely to change anytime soon. The displacement is, is, is if anything, likely to uh, be continue into the future. And in some ways, we have to factor this into our, our, our planning within district or, or national plans. Um, then, uh, you know, moving into the district scale. Uh, the analysis was, was very clear in, in highlighting the trend that, uh, you know, uh, unplanned urbanization in, in the district compounded with high fertility rates was, was going to result in huge land pressures as the population grows by 35% in, in the coming 10 years. That's the host community. Um, and in, in, uh, in comparison, the, um, the refugee settlement uh, was, was relatively unpopulated. Uh, large amounts of land, uh, particularly arable land, uh, which is uh, you know, particularly valued by the community adjacent to key water sources, and was already starting to lead to so potential tensions with hosting communities. Uh, and, uh, but the settlements itself, the refugee settlements themselves were actually fairly compact and de demonstrated relatively good planning. Um, so actually could be used as a way uh, to, to kind of discuss with the local government since the refugee settlement had been there for more than 50 years uh, to see if there was a way to use that land more effectively and include within a wider plan. So the case therefore was, was being, being developed to make to the district government to see how this could be included within the wider district development plan that the World Bank was, was planning actually at the same time as we were doing this. Um, and that really helps then if you're looking at what infrastructure to invest, how can it have co-benefits, how can service provision be, be matched across uh, so that it can be easily shifted or better, or, or, or let's say more efficiently shifted from humanitarian actors back to local authorities. Um, in terms of the infrastructure itself, uh, again, in the case of Naki Valley, connectivity was, was coming up again and again as, as the key issue um, and the key inhibiting factor in allowing any long-term development to really take place. So a really simple exercise was done in, in, in the information collection was, was running an analysis on, on 
how far you could travel within one hour based on the current road conditions and basically then showing what you could um, what that would be if you were to improve those key arteries to allow um, you know, road travel at a slightly better speed, we say, or more effective speed. Um, and then if you if you overlay this with the various markets, agricultural productive areas, and the population centers, again, helped us build a really solid case for prioritizing the intervention along that key access road. A um, lot more analysis uh, and information in the scenario, in, in the profiles themselves, but the, the kind of findings or, or our final, uh, let's say, uh, conclusions of these profiles are a set of these scenarios, which, which, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and these are quite important because what we, what we think is useful is to show what will happen if we just carry on on the business as usual um, and show what, you know, because that tends to be the path of least resistance, but at the same time, uh, there are consequences to that. So in what we're showing here, however, is a more, let's say, a more optimal perspective. Um, and again, highlighting, you know, if specific interventions such as the road in, in investment, such as uh, land management recommendations around confirmation or boundary verification, um, land use or ownership database, so that th these, these um, pieces of land, which are becoming more and more valued, can be managed better. Um, and then also looking at uh, harmonizing planning activities outside the camp boundary with, within, with those that are happening inside, focusing on water management, waste management, and energy provision. For example, how to link the, energy, the, the microgrids to, to the national grid, for example. Um, so that's a sort of super quick uh, overview. Um, since the tool was, la was launched last year uh, at UN Habitat, we've been testing this out in a few other locations trying to improve the methodology a little bit, um, working also with local authorities to do this, incorporating a municipal finance perspective to see, okay, how could, how could actually the financing of the infrastructure be included in, this, in these discussions? We're also looking at um, how to carry out these kind of activities when travel or, or, community, or community engagement is, is more, more difficult. So looking at remote uh, modalities and also at the same time, looking at more detailed um, scenario building so that you know, we can bring in much more depth to them and have a lot, uh, again, a stronger case at the end. So we've completed profiles now for Dadaab, uh, Kalabaye and Kakuma in, in Kenya, as well as uh, Koloji IDP settlement in Ethiopia. Um, and now we're also incorporating this into a, a, another program where we're focusing on more traditionally urban contexts, so actual cities, which are hosting uh, large proportions of, of, of displaced populations in Jordan, uh, Egypt, and Cameroon, and, and seeing very much how the municipalities themselves can, can, can be more structurally engaged with this kind of approach. Um, so that's, yeah, that's it from, from, from our side. But I think, John, you wanted to talk a little bit more about how UNHCR are going to also take this forward. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan, and um, thanks for going into a lot of the technical details there. I mean, as you, you can see from Jonathan's presentation, a, um, a comprehensive settlement profile needs quite a bit of expertise. It needs very strong collaboration, primarily with host governments, um, uh, other humanitarian actors. Um, it, it, it also needs um, strong support from GIS colleagues because there is quite a lot of GIS analysis needed to um, develop these profiles. Um, the collaboration with UN Habitat has been very, very fruitful and, and we continue on a technical level to, to engage with each other on, on what we're doing. We're slightly going separate paths on this, I think, as, as regards next steps. As Jonathan said, they are certainly looking more at cities and more the urban context. From UNHCR perspective, I think we're we're looking at more um, the settlements, the camp um, scale, more the micro scale of the three scales of development that Jonathan outlined, um, macro, meso, micro. Um, and we do want to try and um, make these profiles um, lighter so that they can be delivered in-house with the technical um, uh, teams we have available both within the technical support section and, and indeed at country level. Um, so there is a need to, to, to make it lighter so that we can do it in-house within, within a, a relatively shorter time period. One other area we are looking at is, is with the huge emphasis uh, at the moment on, on greening the response and making sure that our responses in settlements is more environmentally friendly. We are looking at trying to replicate 
um, profiles under a an environmental lens. So to do a spatial analysis of a settlement with a view to identifying what infrastructural investment projects should be prioritized in order to make that settlement greener. Um, a number of challenges, I mean, um, who takes responsibility for the recommendations outlined in these profiles and particularly how we can get investment to carry forward on the recommendations within the profiles is, is an area that needs a bit more work. It, it has to be multi-agency, um, but they can be quite expensive. So it's ensuring that we have buy-in and um, who takes responsibility for implementing the recommendations going forward um, is another area that we need to look at. So I think with that, um, we, we can end um, just to say thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is showing a link where the uh, settlement profiling tool can be, can be downloaded and um, we're available for, for any questions um, if you'd like to raise any now. Over to you. Cool, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan and John. Um, that was a really interesting um, overview. I think uh, what was very apparent from the presentation was just the huge array of different stakeholders that you need to sort of coalesce around a singular vision of what you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve. I guess maybe a question that might be useful for some of the, the camp managers and CCCM practitioners who are watching this is within that sort of like constellation of different actors and processes that are undertaken when, when profiling a settlement, uh, where do you see the role of CCCM, uh, either like a camp management or from a coordination function in doing that, maybe drawing from experiences? I know Cox Bazaar was, was a very tricky sort of situation um, in terms of getting everyone on the same page. Uh, yeah, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. John, do you want to start or shall I? Sure, sure. Happy, happy to give it a go. Uh, thanks for the question, Bruce. I mean, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Cox Bazaar is, is a, um, uh, a unique uh, experience. Um, it, it's, it's the scale of Cox Bazaar is phenomenal. But the work we did do with, um, with UN Habitat, at, at one stage we had embedded two UN and Habitat urban planners into our, our uh, UNACR response and 50% of the time was being given to support um, coordination uh, efforts in, in Cox Bazaar as well. And it, there, was, there was strong emphasis on the macro settlement development plan, which, which has been referenced, and that came up with some key recommendations on how to uh, improve the settlement from a layout perspective, from a environmentally friendly perspective, blue-green networks, and also um, identifying additional land for expansion. So there was some very, very strong recommendations coming through on the macro settlement development plan that was done in Cox Bazaar. That, that cannot be done by, by one sector alone, Bruce, as you've rightly said. It needs buy-in from a multitude of stakeholders to make this work. However, with the political nature in Cox Bazaar, it was somewhat challenging uh, getting that comprehensive buy-in with this uh, macro settlement development plan. And I'm sure colleagues on online are, are, are very much aware of this. Um, but you're right, it, it does need it does need multi-sectoral, multi-agency, multi-actor buy-in. It can't just be settlement uh, and shelter colleagues alone. The CCCM initiative um, 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 and support is also required. So um, maybe Jonathan, just, just hand back to you and you can take that forward a bit. Sure, thanks, thanks John. No, no, I, I agree. And I think Bruce, fr from my perspective, it's, uh, as stakeholders in the in the inform in like developing this the, these profiles uh, are key because that's where you are able to pull out the key information and issues on the ground. Um, for me, uh, it, it, you know the the idea of the way that these profiles are developed is that they're reflecting you know information from from various stakeholders that are then consolidated. So for, you know being able to make sure that those nuances of of of, of what's happening in the area are. Are, are, are key and therefore the CCCM are the ones who tend to have the most diverse perspective of the various issues because CCCM crosses many sectors anyway. So, so I think for us, we see 
well, the way we developed this was that, you know, you develop this through process of consultations with, with different uh, sectors and information. And the idea is that it, it captures that information and synthesizes it into some findings, which represents, let's say, the, the kind of crystallizes the key issues from each of the sectors that might not reflect all of the needs of all of the sectors, but highlights key issues that look that like are hampering long term development from each of those different sectors. And therefore, the idea is that, you know, if you have this consolidated base that helps to agree, you know, some common priorities and common consensus on, on what those key issues are, then you can work on, on taking that forward. So CCCM for me is really key in being able to feed in the information. So, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, 